Hello everyone, welcome to today's Novage webinar, Parametric 3D Modeling Techniques in Rhino and Grasshopper. Are you ready for some real-world 3D modeling applications? Today, you will learn about the 3D capabilities of Grasshopper, as well as the differences between NURBS and meshes, and when to choose one approach over the other. The webinar will also show how to combine the best of both worlds with a hybrid modeling technique that uses the new sub-D geometry featured in Rhino 6 and 7. Uh, today's webinar presenter, Marco Traverso, is an engineer, designer, and authorized Rhino trainer specializing in 3D modeling and computational parametric design. In his work as a 3D consultant, he develops workflows and tools for mm -hmm. integrating the parametric capabilities of Grasshopper into different design pipelines, from concept to production. His published work can be found at marcotraverso.it and is the founder of Car Body Design, a leading website on transportation design since 2004. And now let me tell you a little bit about Novedge. Novedge is changing the way designers purchase 3D software, offering more choices, more freedom, best advice, faster service, and most importantly, no headaches. Check us out at novage.com. This is the page uh, where we um, showcase Rhino. Uh, you can check it out. And you can find us on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it. And uh, reminding everybody that today's webinar will be recorded and I will post it later on on YouTube and Vimeo just search for Novage. And now let me show Marco's screen. So he can um, he can start his demo. Take it away, Marco. Hello, Barbara. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you for participating. Thank you, everyone, and thank Novaj and Barbara for having me again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be talking a little bit about Grasshopper again. Our after our first webinar done in March. Now, uh, the first webinar, we talked about the design of patterns. Now, patterns are a big part for any Grasshopper user because it's the perfect application for this, uh, this tool. Uh, there is a lot of geometry and a visual algorithm uh, tool like Grasshopper is just uh, perfect for, for modeling this type of texture, complex, intricate stuff. Now, today I wanted to do something different, and it was a little bit of a challenge to find uh, something that could be uh, di different, but at the same time interesting for, for many people. Now, we'll be covering patterns, so don't worry about that, but uh, at the same time, I, I wanted to put the accent not, not so much on the pattern themselves, but on the choices that we can make when uh, modeling using the parametric tool like Grasshopper. Now, we usually, have many different ways for modeling using a 3D mod direct 3D modeling approach. But when switching to parametric design, we need to, to take into consideration also other factors. And this is something that I want to show you with very simple examples. In addition to this, I also wanted to touch on a, on a topic that is um, very important to me. Um, I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's becoming more and more relevant for today's designers in, in, the, in the field of 3D modeling, which is mesh modeling for designers. And when I say mesh modeling, I'm primary, primarily thinking about uh, subdivision surfaces. So today we have the tools within Rhino and within other software to just combine the best of both worlds and to use meshes where they are strong and to use nerves where they are strong. So I wanted to show this because I, in my um, daily work as a designer, consultant and a trainer specialist, uh, I, I work with many different uh, designers and architects and I have seen them that most of them are familiar with the usual nerves uh, approach, the CAD, the typical CAD geometry approach. And uh, showing what is possible to do today with meshes in combination with other tools is something that 
uh, they always found quite interesting. So I wanted to, sh to share this, uh, this information. So uh, we would be basically dividing the webinar in two parts. Uh, the first part will be about strategy, different modeling strategies, and the second part will be focusing about the difference between nerves and meshes. So it's already demo time. I, I, I basically uh, decided to do everything inside Rhino and Grasshopper. And uh, this is uh, like the first webinar. This is not going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial because obviously uh, if we had to explain every single step, then we could not cover much material. So I wanted to give um, uh, many information. And uh, uh, as usual, if you have any question, uh, you can write a message in the chat window. And Barbara, you can interrupt me whenever you think it's, it's good. Uh, and uh, also, we will be uh, doing this for about an hour. Then we will have a uh, question and answer, maybe a little less than an hour before the question and answer. But as it happened the last time, um, we went, uh, went on for almost other 30 minutes. So uh, if there is enough interest, I'm perfectly willing to, to do this even this time. So we will see as we go. We will try to not to force us within a time frame. Uh, but within an hour, you uh, you will hopefully you will get some interesting information. So let's dive in and uh, let's uh, see something very very simple. Now, when we uh, do 3D modeling using the direct modeling approach, which means inside the viewport we don't care about history, we don't care about non-destructiveness, uh, we don't care about parametric design, we can do stuff in many different ways. Uh, if we just think about the cylinder, we can create it using a primitive, using an extrusion of a curve or an extrusion of a surface. We can also do it by revolving a profile curve around a vertical axis, or we can pick two curves and loft them. And the result is very similar. There are some differences, but uh, in terms of geometry, the, the, the differences are very, very tiny. So we can say that when we model in the 3D viewport, we just worry about the final result. And we, as long as we get the geometry that we need, we are going to choose the approach that maybe that fits better in our workflow, the way of working, personal preference. We are not too picky about that. And even if it takes uh, a couple of seconds to do something, since we uh, are doing our modeling workflow with many, many different steps, it doesn't change anything if we have to wait for one second more. Now, when we switch to Grasshopper, things get a little bit different. So in this case, for example, I have uh, created a an, an version of this cylinder with a solid fillet. Now, if we think about the solid fillet applied to this cylinder, we could just select the top edge of the cylinder, the bottom edge of the fillet, of this uh, cylinder, and then we can use the fillet edge command. And so we can do that inside, inside uh, Grasshopper. So I'm highlighting, when I uh, click on the component, just so that uh, if someone is not perfectly familiar, at least knows what I'm doing, more or less. So I click here and you can see the preview, the visualization of the piece of geometry that's inside the component. So basically what I have done here, I have created a cylinder, and then I selected the edges. I don't want to go in detail about I did, I, how I did it. But the important thing is that I apply the fillet edge using this component right here. And now I have my solid fillet here. And it can be changed by just adjusting this parameter here, as I would expect. Now, one thing that I want you to notice is this small number, this tiny number inside this tooltip. Now, this is, is, this is called the profiler. And uh, if you use Grasshopper, you can find it under the display menu. You have canvas widgets. And here we have our profiler. Now, this is showing the time that is required uh, to compute, to solve what's inside this specific component. And it's, it's only shown where when the time is more than a given threshold. In this case, I have set this threshold to uh, just one millisecond. So everything that takes more than one millisecond, we see here. This means that all these elements, when we don't see anything be below them, 
they're taking less than one millisecond. So now the other thing that we can do to create the cylinder is to create a number of points, connect them using a polyline, and then fillet that polyline using the same radius value. And then we can create a revolution. Let me just hide these cylinders. We don't need them anymore. And so now we have a solution which is extremely similar to the one that we have here. And by the way, we can also get it to be exactly the same as that. But what we notice is that the process that we see here took more or less, I would say, 35, 40 milliseconds. And the thing that we see here took three milliseconds. So it took 10 times less. Now, we don't care too much in this specific case because uh, it's still a short time and I want to touch on this but it's a great it's a huge difference so why would you want to have something very fast the main reason is that when we use grasshopper what we like to do is to update our definition by using these sliders or graph mappers or other dynamic inputs and in order to be able to do that we need to have a modeling workflow which is very fast because we need to have a time, a total computational time that is well below one second. I would say well below half a second in order to get a responsive uh, behavior. So anything that, that takes longer than that, we are basically forced to just uh, change those values by just uh, getting inside the, the, um, the slider, setting manually, and then triggering the solution again. Because when we move this slider, what happens is that we are triggering multiple solutions. Even if I even if I slide it very fast, I'm not just triggering the last value that I hit, but I'm triggering all is a whole series of numbers. So imagine that we have, for example, uh, let's say that we have 100 cylinders like this. We are applying this operation 100 times. That is going to be to take a lot of time, maybe three seconds. And this means that if I move this slider, for each value that I hit, I'm going to wait three seconds. And even if I hit just three or four values from here to here, then I have to wait more than 10 seconds. So you can understand that this is extremely frustrating, first of all, because we like this kind of experience, like playing with the, uh, the knobs of, of something like a synth or a, as something that gives you an instant gratification. But the important thing is that this allows to just uh, tweak and fine tune our design and find the exact value that we are after. So the first uh, thing that we want to take into consideration is speed. And by speed, I don't mean speed of uh, creating the, for creating the definition, but we sometimes we need to take more steps, but we can get up to a point where the speed is really high. Now, I want to show you an example that is a bit of an extreme here. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that I recently published on uh, ShapeDiver, which is a platform for uh, publishing parametric models done in Grasshopper. And it gives the ability uh, to change these parameters directly using a web interface. So this is a 3D model inside the, the web browser. And user can just go there and change parameter using knobs, using these sliders, drop-down menus. And th this is something that is, uh, it requires a little bit of time because you have some time to, to get to the server and back. And uh, you need to minimize the time that is required to create the definition inside Grasshopper because otherwise you are going to wait for a long time. So this is a geometry that was created with exactly this purpose. So sometimes we don't want just a, a geometry which is perfect in terms of uh, um, tolerances or it's ready for production. But in this case, for example, we are just aiming at maximum speed. So we want the maximum possible speed given um, so that the interaction can be uh, good for the final user. So in this case, the strategy uh, for, for creating something like this is to switch as soon as possible to mesh operation because uh, meshes are very fast to compute, we'll see later. 
And uh, so whenever you want to have speed, meshes are usually involved. Okay, let's go back to a Rhino here. And uh, let's see another simple example of different speed that we can have with different workflow. In this case, what I have is just a simple surface inside Rhino, and I'm targeting that from Grasshopper, referencing it, and I'm creating a grid of points here using the device surface component. Now, I want to create a simple grid of uh, elements. In this case, I, I've chosen to, to create a circle. So what I can do is pick all those points, then I create for each point a base plane, and then starting from that plane, I'm creating a circle. But I can do something different because I could, for instance, create the circle just once here in the origin, and then I'm going to move it, making copies basically of that cylinder to the target point. So the final result is exactly the same in this case, but the approach is different. Here we create the circle many, many times and in particular, more than 100 times. And here we are creating it uh, one time and copying it many, many times. Now, if we have a look at the time, we can see that, uh, strangely, uh, the first method is faster than the second one. Even if these values, when you have values that are so low, it's not very indicative of, of the actual times. But this is because the circle is a very, very simple shape. So even if we create a circle many, many times, it won't take too much, too long. But now let's imagine that we want to create an array of a different element. And I, for example, I picked a simple filleted box like this. So we have our box and I'm just showing a little bit of steps to get there so that uh, at least we have a, an idea of the strategy involved. And now here, uh, we can have the new fillet edge component inside Grasshopper, allows to replicate the functions of the Rhino fillet edge command. We just need to uh, uh, give to this uh, component a list of edges. And then we can change our fillet radius very easily. So what we can do, we can create it once, and then we are going to copy that shape onto our target grid points. And this is taking more or less 50 milliseconds. Now, I could also do something different because what I could do is, like we did before, start from the points, create the box on the points, and the box is a very simple shape, so it's taking very, very, uh, it's very, very quick. And then we apply the same thing, and then we have the fillet edge. Now, I did not use the fillet edge. I did not enable this because I did it separately. And what we see here is that for a similar configuration, we, the, the final solution time that we see over here is more than 10 seconds. So this, is, this basically means that uh, it breaks, it completely breaks the, the interaction. If we do this, we are able to change the fillet in real time, almost. And you can see that it, it's going to change. And it, the, actually, the time that is uh, uh, required is not so much for the generation of the geometry, because you can see that this is quite quick, but because Rhino needs to uh, prepare the underlying meshes for visualization, and we will speak about this. So this is very fast, and this is taking really uh, more than 20 times longer. Let's switch to another example. And in this case, what I wanted to show you is how to create um, a solid slab like this. We have a solid slab and we have a grid of uh, holes. In this case, we are using not circles, but uh, polygons to define the profile of these holes. So this is our um, final um, final goal. And you can see that this curve is our uh, starting point, is a rectangle, and it's defining not the outer border, but just the um, area where we have the centers of the holes. So 
we'll see different approaches and we'll see how we can uh, choose the right one depending on our requirements. So the basic idea here is to create a planar surface starting from that border, divide it, so we have a new grid of points, and then from this grid of points, we can create our holes. And by the way, you can notice that in addition to the number of segments that in this case is set to six, so we have hexagons, we can uh, also change the fillet radius from here. Once we have our holes, it's time to create our outer border. And we can do that in different ways. So for example, what we can do is to pick um, the reference rectangle and just adjust, uh, scale it up using a factor. Now what happens, and we can switch to the top view in order to have a better view of this. Now what happens is that you can see that the distance here and the distance here are quite different because they are actually depending on the aspect ratio of this shape because if we apply a uniform scale then obviously this edge will be shorter than this. Now this is usually not the best solution because we want to have some kind of control over the dimensions especially if we are running uh, if you are designing a piece for production. So we need to know the thicknesses and, and many other uh, actual dimensions. But there is one uh, case where this could be helpful because for instance, if we create a library of patterns, so we want to use uh, on different applications, different panels, then having an absolute value for uh, a distance is not the best thing because we want to change it depending on the situation. So having something like a scaling factor can make sense. So this can, in, can be useful in those cases. So if we want to, have, to be able to have control over the dimensions, what we can do from the border is to just create an offset. When we do that, now we are sure that the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from here to here. But we are not controlling the actual gap that, is from, that exists from the outer border to the closest point of those uh, holes. And that is important in many cases because we want to keep it uh, over a minimum distance for uh, tolerances and manufacturing limits. So if we want to be able to control that, we are going to use another method. So in this case, we start from the holes and we create the bounding box, which is a box that contains all these uh, geometries. And then we project it and extract the edges in order to get a new border and then we can offset that border. So the final result is something where we control the distance that we have just described. So Martin, these are- A quick question. Yes. How can we yes, visualize sure. timing of components, like the balloon with nine MS, for example? Yes, we can go here, display canvas widgets, profiler. Now I disable it. If I want to enable it again, profiler, and now you can see this component right here. Cool, thank you. Uh, we can go also to preferences and under widgets, you can see that there is a, also a checkbox here and here you can set the threshold. So if you are not interested in things that take, I don't know, 20 milliseconds, but you just want to find those that are over, I don't know, half a second, you can tweak this value over here. Excellent. Does this answer? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Okay, so let's uh, move on. So we have our holes and then we have our border. Now, how do we create the final slab? Now, obviously, the idea is to create a, a base, a flat surface with the holes and then to extrude it. And we'll, think a we'll talk a little bit about that. But a perfectly fine method could be to create a planar surface out of this new outer border and then use the curb holes to split it into pieces. Now, when we do that, uh, we, are, we are ending up with a list of many, many different pieces because we not only have 
the trimmed surface, but we also have the individual uh, pieces that we got from the holes. And, and so we need to select which one we want to keep. And in this case, we are using the list item with the index set to zero. So we are taking the first element that happens to be exactly what we need. Now you can see that the surface split is quite, uh, quite efficient because uh, it takes relatively low time compared to other components. And in this case, we can just select the, the pick the first one and, and we are done. Now there is also another possibility. So we can pick the curves of the holes plus the outer border, merge them into a single list and then apply the boundary surface component which is going to create a single trim surface. Now, if you look at the time, it's more or less similar, but there are two things. One is that for complex shapes, uh, the, split, uh, the splits operation is usually uh, more time consuming. But the important thing is that many times we are going to split um, elements without knowing the, the, the order, without knowing the, the, how the list of pieces is going to be made. So for instance, if I create a circle here and the line. Now I'm going to split the circle with this line. Now I get two pieces. Maybe I want to pick the one that is on the top. How do I know in this list that contains many, many different pieces, what's the index of the one that I need? So in this case, when, when we have something like this, and sometimes uh, Sometimes we can solve it by applying the boundary surface component in, an, in a suitable way, but many times what we need to do is to just create a condition and something that manages, that teaches Grasshopper how to handle this. So in this case, what uh, the condition could be pick the one where the average position of the center is uh, towards the positive y. So I can compare the position, sometimes I can compare the size, but this is not about 3D modeling now, this is more about uh, data management, it's more like programming Grasshopper to behave in such a way so that it's working in a flexible and robust way. And this is key. Uh, so the first condition that we have seen is speed. The second condition was the choice of parameters depending on what we want to achieve so we can pick different variables. And this, the third, the third factor is uh, flexibility and robustness. Robustness means that I can, instead of giving Grasshopper a circle like this, I could have whatever shape I want and I could have a different splitting curve, but I want to be able to tell Grasshopper to just pick always the same piece, the, the one that I need. So in that case, I need to find a way for telling him or sometimes the modeling strategy can be arranged so that to avoid that. Sometimes cannot be avoided, but I won't go into the detail of that because it's a little beyond the 3D modeling aspect. It's more about uh, programming really, creating an algorithm and a logic. So once we pick one of those two, let's move on. And we can create a solid extrusion by just defining a slab thickness and extruding and if I switch to the perspective view, you can see that now we have a thickness and we have a solid piece. Now, just to, to make a, a very quick consideration, obviously we could also do something crazy and start from the curves and extrude them, or better, create uh, planar surfaces, extrude them, and then perform a solid difference now, you already know that this is going to take a long time, but I want to show you how long it takes by just showing the screenshot. It took almost a minute. So this means that when we are working in a parametric uh, uh, program like Grasshopper, we should just forget about making solid uh, operations, solid Boolean operations. So sometimes we cannot avoid them, but in, that, in those cases, what we want to do is to go up to a certain point. So for example, we could create um, the, um, this thing over here, and we could just have a look at the final shape of the hexagons. And we can design everything knowing that in the end, we are going to uh, subtract those, um, those solids, those cutters 
from the from the final shape. So sometimes what we want to do, if we cannot avoid a, a time consuming operation, we can postpone it and we can go ahead and have a look at the curves because most of the time curves are just enough to have an idea of the design. And then we are when we are done, we can just create the cutters and then create a Boolean operation for them. And then even if it's going to take, I don't know, 10 minutes, we can have the coffee. And when we go back to Rhino, everything is done and we, we don't have to do it again. So that's the idea. Okay, so now let's speak a little bit about meshes. Because meshes are a completely different approach for modeling. And I wanted to show you a very, very simple uh, piece of geometry here. So I've created a, a sphere that is done using meshes. Now, meshes are completely different from NURBS because they are not based on any mathematical representation. When we use NURBS and, um, and we are speaking about curves and surfaces, polysurfaces, we are always dealing with shapes that are based on formulas. We don't see those formulas, fortunately enough, but they are there. And this allows us to calculate um, perfect intersections. We can have curvature graphs, which are very important in order to model uh, with a given look in mind. And even if it's within the approximation that any computer does in terms of calculation, we can have a precise representation of the geometry. Meshes are completely different because meshes are made up of a list of points. So if I decompose a mesh here inside Grasshopper, I can see that I see a lot of points. And then all these points are connected using edges, which are these segments here. And when we connect edges, we also give form to faces. And faces are these small surfaces. And this can have three, four edges usually, but can have also more than four edges. So what happens is that there is no relationship between the shape that we see and the formula. So this means that if we calculate the intersection, for example, with the line, we are not going to find the exact intersection that we would find if this was a curve, but we can just find the intersection with the mesh. So it's a very coarse approximation. That's the reason why we basically never used meshes um, inside, uh, inside 3D programs when dealing with the manufacturing um, objectives. So we also see something here. The, the visualization is uh, not smooth. And this is because I, uh, each phase has a different normal direction. So the light is reflecting, it's being reflected in different directions. Now we can think about increasing the count of the segments. So we can increase the resolution. We can think a little bit about it, but there's a limit to it. And sometimes we can go too far away. And sometimes we end up with meshes with million of points and that is going to defeat the, the, say, the very purpose of using meshes. And also, uh, we are not getting up to a curve because we still have polylines. And we cannot think about uh, using a resolution where we have a face for each pixel of the screen, obviously. But what uh, the technology has developed are ways for smoothing out. You can see that from here, we can smooth out the normals and we can go even farther so what any pro 3d program does is to pick the normal direction each phase and to interpolate it between the neighbor phases so what's the difference here we have a nerve sphere now if you think oh you see a very nice reflection this this is really a nice curve this is not true actually because uh, any 3d program for visualization is going to use meshes and we can you can prove it by because we can bake this thing into rhino we select it and we launch the command show render mesh and then we end up with this so this sphere is a sphere because if we create a trim or an intersection, we are going to use the underlying equation of a sphere. So we are going to get something that is accurate. But if we think about its visualization, we are 
looking at a mesh. So we are dealing with meshes even if we don't realize it. So now meshes are very, very interesting. Why are they so interesting? Because of a property, because when uh, we apply modifications to uh, a geometry made with meshes, since the mesh is done by putting together just a bunch of points, the transformation operations are very, very fast because we are not dealing with the complex transformation of uh, equations, morphing operations, something like that. But we are just moving points. So if we are moving points, then the edges that is going to connect the same points is going to be created very, very quickly because we are not changing anything. We are just changing the starting coordinates of those vertices. So we can do some neat stuff. And one of the applications of meshes is for preview, for visualization, not only as we have seen for models uh, that need to go um, uh, like on the web or for visualization inside a movie or a video game where meshes are always used, but also for a designer. Let me show you an example here. So in this case, what I have is a surface or better, a poly surface and two curves. And I had to do something to show like uh, stitching, like this was the surface of a car seat or um, any surface that needs a stitching, maybe a steering wheel or armchair or whatever. And I wanted to have this interaction between the basic curves and the final geometry. And then I wanted to automat automatically generate this 3D stitching. And I was able to do that very quickly using meshes. So now, how does this work? Uh, in terms of general idea, we start basically with uh, our reference curves that are over there. We, in this case, we are projecting them onto a target poly surface. And then we are dividing those curves. And from there, we are creating segments. And then from there, we are using those segments to generate mesh pipes. We can apply also some kind of transformation, we'll see. And the final thing is to create a mesh pipe. Now, if you think about it, we are creating 60 mesh pipes here, and it's taking less than 50 milliseconds. So it's, the process is very, very fast. Now, the good thing is that uh, for visualization purpose, this is enough. I don't have to uh, do anything more than this. I just need to have something that gives me the idea of the final result. And by the way, I can always add a custom preview if I don't want to bake it. And I can create a custom material. And I can assign uh, a different color, like a white. And so now if I switch to the render view, I'm, I'll be able to see the 3D stitching without looking at the actual geometry, uh, the actual wires and all the other stuff. And so now what I can do here is to change the geometry, applying, um, for example, a rotation or having bigger or smaller stitches, or I can change the length or the gap. So this is something that, if you know how to do it, it's not very difficult. And uh, it's a game changing thing. And if you think about doing this using NURBS, I mean, uh, in addition to being very, very slow, it, would make, it wouldn't make any sense because we don't need to actually have a NURBS curve on that. And we can also do something quite nice, which is uh, to apply also some kind of randomness to the shape to just give the impression of uh, a handmade thing. And we can see it better if we switch back to our shaded view. So you can see that we can distort those in a very, very random way. All these operations are very challenging when we use notes. It's possible, but it does not make much sense. 
so in this case, what I ended up with, for example, is something like this. So for visualization is good enough. And also if, uh, if we zoom in close enough, I went on and also created some kind of uh, interwoven uh, fabric uh, fibers. So you can really get crazy once you know how to handle meshes and it's not going to slow down your definition, not, not, not really, not, not significantly at least. You still have uh, interactive interaction with the definition. So we are, we are speaking a little bit um, about uh, meshes. Now let's speak a little bit about sub D. What's sub D? Well, the first thing that we want to uh, explain is uh, what is a subdivision surface to begin with. Now, so far we have, speaking, we have spoken about how to visualize meshes in a smooth way. But uh, apart from that, if I have to create a circle by just creating a polyline, very dense polyline, it, would be very, very frustrating. So fortunately enough, in the late 70s, uh, a paper presented by two people which are very, very important uh, changed everything. So um, Ed, Ed um, Katmul and Jim Clark presented an algorithm for creating a subdivision of the meshes. Now the algorithm is called uh, Katmul-Clark. And uh, by the way, uh, Ed Catmull went on and uh, worked for uh, Lucasfilm and Pixar and became president of Pixar and Disney. And uh, uh, Jim Clark went on to found uh, Silicon Graphics and Netscape. So we are speaking about very, very important uh, persons. But what, what it's interesting for us is that they developed this, um, this very nice algorithm. And you can see here in action, let me just show it to you like this. So we start with this mesh over here and the end result is this mesh over here. And the way it's done is by interpolating, subdividing the faces and interpolating the face, the, the, the vertices. So if we just have a single iteration because this process can be iterated multiple times, we go from here to here, which means that for each face, we are creating four faces and the coordinates of the points is going to be affected by the, the neighbor point with something that is causing a smoothing, a general smoothing of the shape. Now, this seems like a bit hard to control, but really it is not so difficult because what we can do actually is to increase the density of those vertices when we need to stay closer to the original uh, surface and if you can see better if we increase the resolution of the final subdivided mesh. So if I want to have a sharper corner here, I'm going to move this edge closer to there. And if I want a smoother transition, I'm going to pull it far away from it. And as I move it towards this other corner, you can see that I'm sharpening this part over here. Now, this has been something that uh, CG artists, 3D modelers working for video games and movies have always done, always done. And it's a complete, completely different approach. And I've noticed that whoever uses this approach usually don't like, doesn't like to use NURBS and who uses NURBS does, know, does not like to use this because they are very different. Here it's like you're going to solve the puzzle you're going to sculpt manually something. But what we can see is that we have a very, very complex transition over here. And doing this thing in NURBS would, would take quite a long time. And especially if you want to maintain the interactivity of this. So if I want to be able to change the shape and uh, also change the way the transition happens. So by, for example, by doing something like this, you can see that with this method, it's just a matter of uh, moving points and polygons, and we end up with something like this. And I want to show you an example of this. For instance, let's switch to this here. Okay, let's see what we have. Okay, so we start from here and we 
transform that surface into a mesh and we apply different uh, different components. We subdivide the mesh. This is not a smoothing algorithm. This is just creating more density. Then we use some components from Weaverbird, which is a well-known uh, Grasshopper add-on, which is integrated inside Grasshopper. And it's creating for each phase like a frame. And then what we can do is to just add another a little bit of density using again the same approach then we thicken we give a thickness to it and all these operations are very very fast because we are just moving points or creating points and then we apply the final algorithm and you can see that we have almost a solid uh, shape with fillets i say almost because this is not a true fillet uh, and there are a couple of things that we notice first of all it's still a mesh so it's not a curve and secondly it's, uh, it, it, it does not tend to have a, a constant radius, but rather it, it tends to be a, a blend here. And we can do it something slightly different if we want to have less smooth operation. So we can add an outer border like this, and then we create an external edge here. And when we put everything back together, we have this, and the smoothing algorithm is going to create something where we don't have any problem on the outer area. So let's go back to this. From here, you can see that these points here are going to create some problematic shapes. And this is where it gets tricky because really it's all about topology. Now topology is the layout of these faces across the geometry. And when we model using uh, meshes for subdivisions, we only, you always want to have four edge faces as much as possible. And we also want to have, to minimize the number of star points, uh, which like this, uh, and we want basically to create a regular mesh because then the smoothing algorithm is going to work very well. So in order to get rid of this point from the border, what we have done in this case is to create an outer border, connect everything back together, and then uh, do this uh, with the cut mold crack subdivision. Now, why can we really um, speak about working with uh, this type of geometry if we are always dealing with meshes? Because since a few years back, uh, there have been several algorithms that allow you to go from the unsubdivided mesh, which is the one that we see here, to the limit surface, which is the, the, the theoretical surface that we can uh, achieve if we applied an infinite number of iterations. So this process is implemented in many different software. You may remember uh, TIS plans from the past. And today, Rhino is a uh, using the new sub-D geometry, which is an implementation of that that is going to be really, really uh, uh, good for designers. And Rhino 6 has a basic implementation, so we can use it, convert it. And uh, uh, Rhino 7 has a whole set of new commands. And if you are a user of Rhino 6, you can try the beta. is an open beta, public, as always with McNeil. So you can download it and use it along the Rhino 6 version. So what we are doing here Instead, if we just go back to our example right here, what we can do, instead of applying the subdivision in this way, we can just use this mesh over here. So let's go back to this. What I can do is to use the command which is called to sub D, and uh, you have to type it directly because there's no uh, button inside Rhino 6. There is a button in Rhino 7. When we press OK and we hide the original geometry, you can see that now we have the subdivided version. Now, this is a NURBS, or better, this is not a NURBS yet because it can be modified by highlighting the uh, cage. Now, this cage is exactly representing the meshes that generated this shape over here. And you can see this is very fast and we can create very quickly complex organic shapes that we could never create using the standard components in, uh, in Rhino. The drawback is that we need to learn a new uh, way of modeling because this is completely different. But once you master that, it's, all, it's also very, very uh, rewarding because you can get to do complex stuff 
very, very quickly. Once you are ready, you can just get back to uh, in NURBS. Why would you want to do that? Because maybe you are thinking, okay, if I can't keep it like this, I'm happy. I just need to do a, lot, a couple of trims and, and, I'm, and I'm fine. And that's the problem of, of meshes. So I want to show you this. Let's go back to our original mesh here. And let's say that I want to cut the cylinder from here. I don't know, I want to create a hole. And maybe I, 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 I'm going to use this, um, let's, let's use the subdivided version of it. So I'm going to bake it. And so now what I can do is to go to the top view and go to my, I can do a cylinder mesh. So I can go over here. and do something like this. Now I can cut it using a Boolean difference, mesh Boolean difference. Okay, so it looks, it looks, well, we can see that there are problems here. First of all, uh, depending on the resolution of the cutter, we are getting a different resolution here. So in order to have something that resembles a circle, we should use a cylinder with a high resolution. The second thing is that if we try to apply the Cutmull clock algorithm to this, and I'm going to do that by just very quickly uh, referencing it inside uh, Grasshopper and copying the subdivision algorithm here, let's just bake it and see what happens. Okay, so you can see that here, the geometry is really a mess <laughs> because we don't have the topology that I mentioned before. So we have all kind of uh, small triangles and Rhino does not support here uh, angles. So we end up with all these little triangles and triangles can be subdivided only in a, a few cases, but this is not actually uh, the case because you can see that this is, this is not really uh, something we want to use. So the problem with subdivision surfaces is that whenever you have a geometry, which is made in this way, if you want to cut or trim something, then it becomes really hard. Now, the possible way for doing this is to arrange points over here, and I'm going to show you just by drawing it. So if I want to cut a, a circle here, something like this, what I'm going to do is to create something like a polygon and then I'm going to be connecting all the points, all the shapes, so that everything is connected in a regular way. And there are no triangles and everything is smooth enough. But still, this won't be a, a perfect circle, so that's a problem. And secondly, this is very time consuming and sometimes this gets really, really hard. So for people working in the entertainment industry, it's really a form of art being able to make this solid, actually seamless, um, per uh, uh, seemingly, seemingly uh, perfect uh, mechanical pieces that are made all with like something that is more like a puzzle. Now it's rewarding on one part as an intellectual challenge, but for a modeler who needs to get the work done is, an, is a really a hell. So what we want to do instead is to go back to our uh, to our item here. And now what I can do is to transform this into a NURBS, applying the two NURBS command. And now this is a polysurface. So we have used SubD as a bridge towards NURBS. Once we have this, we know that we can use trims, booleans, whatever we like. And this is going to be perfect. So in this way, we are going to get the best of both worlds. We can work with meshes when we need to make complex transition, when we make concept models, and then when we need to make the final trims, the final cuts, 
we can go and use the usual NURBS commands, intersection, trims, Boolean operations. And the nice thing is that we can also do everything within Grasshopper in a non-destructive way. So we can still be able to modify the mesh while at the same time having a look at the final trimmed version of it inside Rhino as a NURBS. So that is what I think is game changing. And I, I wanted to really talk a little bit about this. Even if Rhino 6 does not have all the tools and Rhino 7 is really under development, so I didn't want to dedicate all the time of this webinar, but this is, what, this is something that I really wanted to show you. And uh, so once we know about what we can achieve with this, we can look at uh, modeling with meshes with an eye, with a different eye, because now we know that we can do neat stuff and then we can also bake it as NURBS and then we can apply the usual operation that we do in NURBS. So for example, I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. That's not this, let's show it here, this. So in this case, what we are looking at is an interwoven pattern that was created using meshes, obviously, in a very, very straightforward way. And I wanted to show this because this is quite curious. So we start just from a single curve that you see highlighted in uh, light blue. And from that, we create a surface. And from that, we apply the space, space truss structure, which is found in Launchbox, which is another uh, well-known add-on for Grasshopper. And from there, we get all these lines. Now, we can work on these lines. And what we can do with those is to generate a skeleton as well as some spheres that, in this case, are affected by a point attractor. And then we are going to use this, I would call it magic component, because this is really almost magic. This is called Fatten. And it's not within Grasshopper. I think you can find it on the official forum. I don't know if uh, it's integrated now. Um, and this thing allows you to create from a skeleton, like a mesh, but uh, like a mesh pipe, but you see that it's handling the nodes in a very clean way. And I say clean in terms of topology because we don't have any triangle we don't we the star points are there they're not avoidable but you can see that we maintain a clean topology and this is going to allow us to just apply the catmull crack subdivision algorithm and to get this shape which maybe it's not useful but it's quite nice and quite rewarding because you can get here in like five minutes and knowing that you can really uh, output this and convert it to a sub D and convert it to NURBS and then you can trim it, you can do whatever you, li you like, it's really a game changer. Now the other thing that we didn't mention yet is that when you deal with mesh, the fact that the operations are much faster is going to reflect on the way we are dealing with complex operations like surface morph, for instance. So sometimes we create our pattern or our geometry on a plane, but our target is something that is not planar. This happens all the time because we want to create a library of patterns. So we want to be able to work on the XY plane and then be able to morph something that we have created here. So we have a library of shapes here and we apply to different target surfaces. Now the morphing operation in this case is taking really, really less than one fifth of a second. This is, why is this? Because this is a mesh. So we are really dealing with something that has, in this case, 60,000 points, which is not, it's not, uh, uh, I mean, there are quite a few, but it's still very fast. And by the way, we can also do something different in this case, because we can use the unsubdivided mesh. And in this case, we are cutting the, the times here, and then we can smooth it out after the morphing operation. So even if we want to go to NURBS, we can morph this using meshes and then we have a great benefit in terms of time. Now, uh, one thing that I wanted to show you is that um, this morphing operation can be used as a preview actually. So sometimes 
if we think about more mechanical shapes that needs to be made using nerves, we can just create a mesh and we don't care about the topology of anything. And uh, usually the, the times for this morphing operation are going to be about 100 times faster. So we can use meshes also as a simple preview in the same way that we have used curves as a preview in the first example. Now I want to show you a couple of uh, other things here. Now this is a nice thing because it, it, it's uh, a golf ball, so something quite curious to see. And this comes from a question that was raised in the Italian forum. And uh, the interesting thing was uh, how to model this, this thing over here. And obviously we can do it with nerves, but this thing has something like uh, 400, more or less 400 uh, shapes like these spherical recesses. And so in order to do that with nerves, we need to arrange all the uh, spheres in a given way, which is a, a, a shape that is uh, available from a, a, a Rhino plugin. And this is the actual name of the shape, is the dual geodesic isocosahedron pattern number 16. So if you want to repeat it, that's what it is. So from here, we could do that manually, but uh, imagine you, you have to do 400 Boolean differences. It's not going to be fun. And then on top of that, you're going to have to fillet everything in order to get a, a nice a nice fillet and not a sharp corner. So how do we do that in Grasshopper using subdivide, subdivision surfaces? Well, it's relatively simple because what we can do is uh, to explode this shape. So now we have all these hexagonal faces, octagonal uh, edges. So we can find the centers of these edges. And from there, we can scale down the hexagons and use those edges in pairs to create a small loft. Now, this loft is connecting lines and is a straight loft. So we can transform that loft into a mesh. And then on top of that, we can pick the scale down hexagon and extrude it to a point. And those points are moved along the normals inside towards the inside of the sphere and when we do that again we can transform those triangles into meshes so now what we can do is to just uh, merge everything join everything and we end up with this shape over here now doesn't look like uh, is the right shape but when we apply our magic algorithm here then we get to have our golf ball because the, the hexagons, since they are not, they do not have any supporting edges along this direction, we are going to have a smooth surface, so like a sphere. And by having these supporting edges very close, we are able to get a shape with this sort of blends over there. And by the way, these blends, especially when we think of them in terms of sub D, they are G2 continuous. Okay, so they're very much usable for design. So in this case, if we switch to the render view, we are able to see the final result and we are able to see that it's good enough for something that is done very rapidly. One last thing before uh, going to the question and answers. Uh, another thing that we can do, I just want to show you the final uh, results here. Maybe we have a slide over here. Let's see. No, no slide. Um, but we have the slide because it's the first one. So if I just zoom in here and I want to just uh, show you like here. In this case, the integration of sub D was taken to a, a, to a higher level because in this case, once we had created this pattern over here, with subdivision surfaces, we were able to trans to morph it and to project all the shapes onto a target surface. And it could be also a poly surface because many people have uh, asked me about this. It's a different uh, workflow, a different strategy, but it can be done. And then you, you have this 
NURBS polysurface, which is made by all these small little pieces, but everything is tied together so that we can really, and we can actually see that inside Rhino here. Let me switch to the shaded view again. So this is the shape that we um, end up with. And we and this is a NURB surface. So we have a curvature continuity across the entire pattern. So this means that as designers, we can pick a, a surface that is given us by our technical department. Maybe this needs to go into production, needs to be used on in something like SolidWorks, Katya, or uh, Inventor, or whatever. And we are able to apply this pattern onto a surface without modifying the reference surface. We are not creating a mesh on top of that, like many grasshopper examples show. We are talking about creating a true NURBS uh, shape, very complex, using the best of the meshes, but then we are going to trim here everything back in NURBS, and if needed, we can also create blends and transitions that can be controlled with all the freeform surfacing tools that we have at our disposal. So, I also have a couple of examples that maybe I can show you later, but this was the, the core of what I wanted to, to show you. So uh, this thing is very exciting because today we, we can go full circle. We start from meshes and actually, if we just want to say everything, we can also start by digital sculpting. So if you use ZBrush or Mudbox or whatever program we have, even Blender, we can sculpt the surface, transform it using other tools that I it's just a little cliffhanger for the next webinar, maybe. Uh, we can go to a subdividable mesh, and from there we can further refine it, and then we can use the subd uh, geometry of Rhino to convert this mesh into nerves, and then from there we can trim it and finish it like we uh, are asked, and meeting all the requirements that needs to be met, which is something that happens a lot because sometimes you just cannot uh, change the final, the, the starting uh, surface. Okay, so before getting to the um, question and answers, I just want to thank you. Uh, we managed to be almost within the time, but again, I have time now, so if there are questions, and I'll be happy also to show you a couple of other examples if you want. And I just wanted to give you a couple of uh, notes of information about what I do and uh, how to contact me. So I do primarily consultancy and training for uh, 3D modeling. I'm specialized in uh, computational design, so this kind of solutions. And uh, I mostly do regarding training, on-site training or remote training, individual courses or company courses. And uh, I have in program an online course that can be done uh, by groups also. So if you're interested, you can go to the URL that you see now on screen, and you, or you can just send me an email. I'll be happy to, to, to answer you. And uh, again, thank you very much. And I hope it was interesting. And I hope I sparked some curiosity, or maybe uh, you're going to tomorrow, you're going to use some new tool and see how it works. And uh, uh, so again, thank you very much. And now it's a uh, the time for the questions and answers then thank you thank you marco i hope you guys screenshot the image or uh, wrote it down and uh, give marco a call and uh, that was so useful marco thank you so much i have a couple of questions from our um uh, attendees uh first of all what is b rep uh b rep is the the name that we use in grasshopper to say polysurface now, since uh, it, it looked like Grasshopper was not hard enough to learn, uh, they somehow decided that the names should just be different for something. So BREP is just polysurface, like uh, boundary surface is just planar surface. So uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a problem when you just start out, but uh, you learn to, uh, to, to just be used to, to get used to this. Yeah, you get familiar with these um, new names. And um, another question: um, Can you project? Can you project the stitches on a NURB surface? Uh, 
That was an herb surface. Okay. The, the, the one that we saw, let me go over here. If I go to the 3D stitching layer, let me see what we have here. And we switch back to the definition that was here. No, let me see. I've lost it. Too many things here. Yes, over here. So you can see that these are done by projecting these two curves onto this shape. And now I cannot uh, alter this shape directly because this is a poly surface, actually. So, but if I uh, I can, for example, shape it differently, rotate it. You can see that the stitching are updated in real time. So, okay. These are the, the obviously the meshes are segments or polylines, and we can change the accuracy of them by just going here and decreasing the accuracy so that we increase the number of segments, but it's not needed for visualization, but this is a polysurface in NURBS. And by the way, uh, another thing that we can do uh, with the 3D stitching, you can see in this animation, uh, what we have here is a surface that is made by altering the, some given points, but we are using the curves that are generated to um, generate also the stitching. So we are we can link the stitching to the actual geometry in order to, to be able to change at the same time the stitching lines and the actual geometry. And that's what we got with this shape over here, actually. Awesome, awesome. Is the mesh G2 continuous to the NURB surface? Okay, so... Um, Meshes, uh, when we speak about um, G2 continuity, obviously we are not speaking about meshes. Uh, so we refer to this when we transform meshes to sub D and then to nerves. So this means that if we pick an example like um, the shape that we see here, once we transform that mesh into a final nerves, then the continuity across all these little patches, because if I explode this, I get individual NURBS patches, and they are all, all going to be G2 continuous. Uh, when we work uh, with the, what I showed you here, so in this case, what we have is made of two things. Uh, the first thing is this pattern, which is made by many small um, NURBS patches. And then we have the original surface, so we can explode it. No, let's not explode it. Let's just extract a single one because otherwise it's going to take a while. Um, so we are going to pick this. So let's move it out of the way. So we are trimming that that surface with the border of that because we have projected the shapes the, the original um, mesh onto the the surface or the poly surface now sometimes we get directly a g2 continuity because the, the accuracy is good enough sometimes if we don't get it like if from here to here we just have a simple tangency that's not a problem because we can trim the surface with uh, something like a border like this. And then we can create a blend between these borders. So even if it's not there out of the box, which sometimes is the case, like uh, this case, I, I, I seem to remember that it was already G2 continuous, but even if it's not, we can get to be G2 continuous by uh, creating additional geometry, just by creating a blend and uh, between the original geometry and this. The important thing is that the geometry that we see here is exactly the same that we received because sometimes this is a, something that is done by an ONDM which is provided uh, where the, the manufacturer is going to provide the ONDM company with uh, geometries that need to be uh, just uh, 
don't, 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 must not be changed in any way. I don't, I don't know if this answered the questions. I hope so, but I certainly got it. <laughs> so how do you decide to send the production model as NURBS versus as a mesh? Okay, let's say that we usually want to use uh, NURBS because we have we can measure things. So we can measure exact points, exact curvatures, exact thickness. And if we have a mesh, even if we have a high density mesh, so let's say that, and I'm going to just draw something because it's easier. So let's say that we have a corner that is made like this and we have something like this. Now, the first problem that we have is this, that these are sharp corners and when we manufacture something, uh, we usually want to avoid because these are possible starting point for uh, cracks and uh, fatigue uh, failures. So that's one thing. And then again, we uh, want to be able to know what's the radius here, what's the distance here. And you can see that even if this, this is very, very dense, the, the actual distance is not, cannot be measured in a unique way. We cannot pick accurate, accurate um, measurements with the mesh. That's the first thing. The other thing is that for some, uh, for some manufacturing, depending on the manufacturing processes, uh, we may want to just output like uh, a path for a CNC milling machine. And that is going to take as an input uh, a curve and not a polyline. So uh, it's better to provide a, a curve because that has a better resolution. So the final surface, the final piece will look better. Obviously, if we are thinking about 3D printing, we can just use uh, an STL file, provided that we have enough resolution. So it's also a matter of tradition, I guess, because in, uh, in the end, many uh, processes will just pick uh, the geometry with a given accuracy. So sometimes we can just use meshes if they are dense enough. But again, we are not able to uh, just uh, run some testing and do some proper measurement on, on meshes. Okay. And now the million dollar question. So everybody's oh. asking, everybody's asking uh, if they could uh, get the files you've been using for this demo. Yeah, I know that, that <laughs> there was a similar question <laughs> last time. Uh, yeah. Well, I cannot share um, some of the things that we have seen today because obviously it was work done for uh, clients and uh, it's also a core uh, of my work. So yeah. uh, it required a lot of time and yeah. investment. And yeah. But um, okay, I can say two, two things, a couple of things. I can clean up the definition and leave some of the main basic ideas that can help you just get started because sometimes we just have problems in setting up a basic definition. So I, that I'm going to share uh, what I can share. Okay. The other thing is a small, maybe it's a small shout out, but uh, I, I can do it uh, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, uh, if, if you're interested in knowing more in learning how to do these things, uh, you can always contact me and uh, individual courses can uh, focus on similar things. So some of the things that we have seen today was, were developed uh, with the individual training. So sometimes I just uh, get contacted by someone who's working on something and we always, it's always a little bit of a trade-off between a, a training class. So we need to be explaining everything. We are not focusing on just providing a consultancy. That's a different thing, obviously but we are able to tackle the individual aspects of this. And, uh, but if you have any question, I mean, you can uh, um, send me an email and I'll try to help you out. Uh, yes, and you know, um, Marco's super nice and you know, investing in training, it's always a great investment because it brings you up to speed in no time and you do the right things once and, and then you're, often and you go doing your wonderful things the right way and uh, also there's a couple of other questions but i i want to yeah i want just everybody to contact marco for you know there's a request of where do you find freelance job and other stuff that maybe um 
uh, you know, we, we don't have time for at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And also, uh, yes, I want to thank Marco for this extra precious time that he has shared with us. And um, let me, sorry to uh, switch the screen. Let me see. Oh, yeah, yeah. If I can, no uh, because I want to show, I want to show everybody um, where, um, first of all, where they can find Rhino and Novage.com. And uh, with, uh, we also sell a lot of Rhino plugins. And uh, I want to remind everybody, very important, because this is a, a question that I've been asked a lot if um, the webinar is gonna be available later on today, the question, the answer is yes. I'm recording the session and I'll post it on YouTube and Vimeo as early as a couple of hours. So you can watch it on YouTube as many times as you want, just search for no veg. And uh, yes, for the other question, maybe um, I'll, I'll write it down and uh, pass them on to you and then we will give individual response because we're running out of time. Thank okay, you okay. so much, Marco. This was a very useful, amazing as usual. Well, I you. hope you guys wrote down uh, those emails and took a screenshot. If you didn't, and if, if you want to ask, uh, get back to us, we'll be very happy to provide um, Marco's information. Um, yes, that, that was fantastic. Thanks again for joining us today. And thank you, Marco. Have a great rest of the day or night if you're overseas. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.